So this patient uh, was a uh, patient who, I mean, it's a very recent case. Uh, she was admitted just last month and discharged a few weeks ago. So um, she was uh, sent by a neurologist because um, uh, she was being treated for a uh, seizure disorder with anti-epileptics, okay? Um, they knew that the patient was having low sugars, uh, but because of COVID, she, she didn't come up. She didn't come for any uh, uh, medical attention. So she was always having blood sugars. They, they, they kept giving her frequent uh, glucose solution, this, that, but it was never diagnosed. The cause was not diagnosed. And um, she would continue to be an anti-epileptic. She was always very sleepy, drowsy, somnolent. She was falling and she was having seizures. And it came to a point like, she also started injuring herself. She had some laceration over the eyebrow and when she fell. So the family was like, you know, we have to do something. So because she was falling, she was having seizures in spite of having, uh, even, even after taking anti-epileptics and blood sugars were low. They were even aware of that, but they didn't do anything about it. Um, they were just giving her frequent uh, meals and, uh, you know, the sugar and that's it. So uh, we heard from, um, from, from, from a neurophysician. Um, so, She's not diabetic, okay? So um, hypoglycemia in a diabetic patient is very common. All of you know what causes hypoglycemia in a diabetic patient, but she was, a, she was never a diabetic. So when she came in, her blood sugar was like, like after admitting her within a few hours, her blood sugar was 30 milligrams. And um, immediately we got some lab tests done when the blood should be, even before correcting the hypoglycemia. It's very important that all of you must have diagnosed the case already. You know? Yes, and I'm sure, and, 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 I, and I tell you your diagnosis, your suspicion is correct. It turned out to be correct. So there is no, um, I should say, there is no puzzle or mystery here. Um, so we wanted to rule out uh, insulinoma. So, and the lab test should be done when the patient is hypoglycemic, not when the sugars are normal to get an accurate result. So when, as soon as they found that the blood sugar was less than 60 or so, that it was, it was actually 30, so we got the insulin level, C-peptide levels, and the random blood sugar level. We got all the three lab tests done. And, um, and <clears throat> she needed to be kept on continuous 10% dextrose uh, infusion without any stop, okay? In spite of that, she was developing hypoglycemia in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the night time, right? Because in the night time, they cannot feed her, isn't it? So, so it was so bad. So you can see the GR, uh, GRBS chart here. See, in spite of giving 10% dextrose, it was falling to 69, 80, 80. Mind you, this is on 10% dextrose. And see, you can see some of the, some, in addition, we had to give her, several times we had to give her 24% dextrose. So this was the uh, result from the time when uh, she was hypoglycemic, random blood sugar was 30, C-peptide was high, and insulin levels were low, right? So all of you remember C-peptide, right? C-peptide is a part of... Uh, insulin, which is secreted by the body, right? So insulin, which you give exogenous insulin, the insulin injections, which you give, um, they don't have a C-peptide, okay? C-peptide is present in insulin, pro-insulin, the, the long insulin molecule, which is synthesized by the beta cells of the pancreas. So if the C-peptide level is high. That means that the endogenous insulin is high. Insulin secreted in, inside the body is high. So that's what it means, C-peptide level meaning being so high and insulin levels are also high, right? So this further, <laughs> we, are, we were almost certain that the patient has insulinoma when the reports came back, but we still had to um, find out why, where, what to do about it, right? So we wanted to localize the tumor or the insulinoma, um, right? I just told you. So we also gave some octreotide, which is known to uh, help in a patient with hypoglycemia but that didn't help for our patient. And there's another, another drug called disoxide, which we were not able to get. It's difficult to get and uh, expensive as well. Um, and, uh, we and we didn't have time to get it as well. So, but we tried octreotide, um, which sometimes helps in patients with hypoglycemia, but uh, not, not in our patient. We asked, we asked the uh, attender, the mother to give frequent cornstarch and glucose and everything, keep giving uh, every hour. Okay, so cornstarch-based feeds it reduces the absorption of uh, of the uh, the glucose from the from the gut. So uh, finally, see CT scan. Usually, some a lot of times CT scan can pick up, but in our case, uh, contrast induced CT scan, contrast enhanced CT scan did not show anything mass. 
And so we went for an endoscopic ultrasound and that revealed a mass, a 12 millimeter mass in the tail of the pancreas. Okay, 12 into 13 millimeter mass in the tail of the pancreas. And they were able to take a FNAC of that, which uh, was suggestive of a NET or a non um, neuroendocrine tumor, sorry, neuroendocrine tumor. It's called as a FN, FNET, functional neuroendocrine tumor. Okay. And uh, most of the neuroendocrine tumors, uh, functional neuroendocrine tumors are benign, right? Almost 90%. And only very rarely they are malignant. And most of them are single, right? Almost 90% of them, of them are single and benign. And very rarely they are multiple and, uh, and malignant. Okay. It's a very rare disease. Uh, supposed to um, uh, affect only three in one million people, right? So it's very rare. And, uh, and the diagnosis is very much delayed in most of the patients because, because first of all, it's not suspected. And second, they don't do the tests like systematically um, as it's supposed to be done. So it's a very, very rare disease. Um, so you suspect it only in a patient with uh, who is a non-diabetic. Okay, and rule out all the systemic causes before you diagnose, before you think about insulinoma, right? This is a special kind of PET scan which you do. This was not required, not mandatory in our patient because diagnosis was almost certain. But then um, they wanted to, at the time of surgery, they, I mean, the endocrinologist and the surgeon, they says, why don't we do it so that we can, we have evidence to say that it is, it is single and not multiple and it's also benign. So, uh, so this showed a, you can see that uh, here, um, enhancing uh, enhancing um, nodule in the pancreas. So it's a special kind, special kind of PET scan called as a dotated scan that showed this nodule, and it also confirmed that there was no other there was no other um, metastasis or no other spread, or uh, and it was uh, unlikely to be cancerous. And <laughs> to be hundred percent certain, again we we did some immunohistochemistry stains with the a post-operative sample, right? Chromogranin, synaptophysin, so these are all histochemistry, immunohistochemistry thing. So um, within within three to four days, within three days we got the diagnosis, and by fourth day we were able to uh, get get the get the problem fixed. We got the surgeon who did a, a <coughs> digital pancreatectomy, laparoscopic procedure, and it was successful with no complications. So we had to do both PET scan and surgery both at the same time, which was difficult to arrange and coordinate, but somehow luckily we, it happened because the next day was a Sunday. So, so after this, after the procedure, the hypoglycemic episode just, just resolved, just like that. See, this was after surgery. You can see um, 8 a.m. and then you got 8.30 p.m. So in between she was probably in ICU or a surgical ICU, right, or in operation theater. So she was getting 10% dextrose, 20% dextrose. And after, after surgery in the evening, just see, sugar cell actually rebounded a little bit. So she doesn't need, she doesn't need any dextrose anymore, right? So um, just, just, uh, just to discuss hypoglycemia, a few general, uh, general issues with hypoglycemia. All of you know hypoglycemia and the Whipple's stride. All of you, do you remember Whipple's stride? Whipple's stride is number one, patient has simple symptoms of hypoglycemia, right? Number two, when you check the blood sugar, it is low. Number three, the symptoms of hypoglycemia disappear when, when, the, when, when you treat it with glucose, right? So that is the full stride. And what are the, I'm not going too much deep into hypoglycemia because all of you know about it. So two kinds of symptoms we have in hypoglycemia. One is sympathomimetic symptoms. Next is neuroglycopenic symptoms, right? Sympathomimetic symptoms is when you start um, having uh, shaking, tremor, sweating, palpitations, anxiety, all those are sympathomimetic symptoms. And they're all um, helpful because immediately you go and eat something or ha have some sugar or something. Um, but in an old patient who has, has recurrent hypoglycemia, they don't, they may not have those symptoms, sympathomimetic symptoms. So in those patients, neuroglycopenic symptoms are more common, um, where patient becomes uh, drowsy, uh, altered sensorium, seizures, um, and sometimes even they may go into coma if they're not treated on time. So those are two kinds of symptoms which you have in um, hypoglycemia. And it should be, I mean, it's an emergency. All of you have seen patients with hypoglycemia who come to the emergency room and 
you give dextrose and you can see a, a immediate uh, response is one of the very few conditions in medicine which have such a dramatic response is hypoglycemia treatment of hypoglycemia very satisfying and other is when patient with opioid poisoning when you give naloxone so say some situations where you can see the dramatic response in front of your eyes so always prevention is better than cure so when you whenever you have, uh, you have a patient that see our patient was a non diabetic okay But, but but most commonly you see hypoglycemia in patients with diabetes so what are the causes of uh, hypoglycemia in diabetic patients you are all aware, well aware too much of insulin and too less food right too much of insulin on too little food delaying or delay of meals not taking enough right recent increase in insulin recent uh, addition of sulfonylureas or other medications notorious sulfonylureas are very notorious right to cause hypoglycemia so try to minimize it in uh, elderly people uh, okay so and uh, in patients who are prone for hypoglycemia so those are common cause of hypoglycemia in diabetics not only those patients who develop acute kidney injury and liver liver failure very common so if you ask me what are the commonest causes of hypoglycemia in diabetic patients i will say mismatch of food intake and insulin or hypo oral hypoglycemic agents that is the commonest cause the other cause which i see very commonly is patient who is developing acute kidney injury so when a patient is developing acute kidney injury the oral medications in insulin are not metabolized not excreted right so that the more prone for hypoglycemia liver failure glycogen stores are gone right in alcoholics liver failure those are also those patients are also prone for hypoglycemia so when a patient is getting hypoglycemia look at the medications take a proper history whether take the patient took double the medication took too much of insulin didn't measure the insulin didn't eat food so what is you have to be a little bit of a detective to find out what went wrong right so most of the times you will you will realize that the patient is not eating or the patient is getting too much insulin or sulfonylurea so those are most common causes then you check creatinine very often you will see that the creatinine has gone up okay they are developing acute kidney injury you look out for other things and also um, yeah these are the common causes and in a non diabetic patient i'm telling you those are the things in those are the common uh, causes in diabetic in non diabetic patients you have to look for other things like say uh, addisons disease the first case which adrenal insufficiency right um, autoimmune disorders like sle and multiple myeloma right and then then comes insulinoma so as far as frequency or likelihood of uh, uh, insulinoma is concerned it is very 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 rare so it should always be last on your list but at the same time you should you should suspect it whenever such an opportunity such a such a such a patient comes to you so as i said recurrent hypoglycemia is very rare condition needs to be addressed promptly and if you don't and symptoms i just discussed right sympathomimetic symptoms and neuroglycopenic symptoms and non diabetics sepsis very common cause in non diabetics um these these people have multi organ failure renal failure liver failure many of them are alcoholics right neuroendocrine tumors are very rare but keep keep it in the differential so insulinoma is more common in the uh, in the entrance exams neat and neat ug and neat pg exams than in the real life okay so uh, although i suspected it two three times in the last uh, 20 years um the first time i have actually confirmed it uh, like this right so um these are the other causes of um these are the way i mean differential diagnosis of hypoglycemia in a patient with who doesn't have diabetes non diabetic patient so um, these are some of the criteria by which you, by which you can uh, diagnose uh, insulinoma the glucose level insulin c peptide pro insulin level being high c peptide high okay so the gold standard test is a 72 hour fasting glucose test right you, you admit the patient check the check the glucose every hour and and the, and tell the sister that <laughs> be ready to give uh, 25% dextrose or 10% dextrose if they develop hypoglycemia so they should they should not waste any time okay? the, the 25% and 10% dextrose um, bottle should be lying by the side of the bed okay so uh, uh, it has to it has to be monitored closely so most of the patients with insulinoma are diagnosed within 70, within 24 hours in fact they don't need 72 hours our patient he died he died she developed hypoglycemia within few hours after admission so uh, for localization you can do ultrasound ct scan mri and sometimes endoscopic ultrasound our patient needed an endoscopic ultrasound 
okay endoscopic ultrasound with fnac is highly sensitive and specific and with negative imaging sometimes you need to do a pet ct scan a special kind of pet ct called dotted scan to rule out metastasis right um, our patient had that as well so so most i mean the only there is no medical treatment for this that's that tumor has to be out right mm -hmm. So uh, get the surgeon to do a well, one of these procedures. So our, our patient had a, had a distal pancreatectomy, laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy, right? And those are the other kind of procedures sometimes the patient may need depending on the site of the tumor, right? So in a non-diabetic, have a high suspicion, patients who are having spontaneous hypoglycemia, rule out other causes, sepsis, renal failure, liver failure, those kind of things, right? It's a, although it's a very rare condition, keep it in the differential, right? Um, so, and it has excellent prognosis, right? Uh, so, the, once the tumor is out, the, the problem is solved, right? So, this was this even came in uh, the media because uh, because it was such a rare and uh, interesting case. Thank you so much.